Welcome back to another video recording of 12 Days in March. In this section, we will cover what you need to know about renal osteodystrophy for the USMLE Step 1 exam. As the name implies, this reflects a degenerative process of the bone secondary to chronic kidney disease. So I know you're thinking, is Zach slipping in his old age? Why such a boring topic? Has he taken leave of his senses? Well, I can address your concerns in one simple word. Well, actually, four simple words. Renal, GI, MSK, and endo. Any disease that crosses multiple organ systems gets them really jacked up down there in Philadelphia. So renal osteodystrophy sits right at the crossroads of four organ systems and tests your understanding of bone metabolism and the key hormonal interactions. So let's get started. And even if you find this incredibly boring, you really, really do need to know this high yield junk. So let's figure out what makes it so darn important. Let's start with a working definition that highlights what this condition is not. That is, renal osteodystrophy does not represent a single pathologic entity. Rather, it reflects the bone changes that take place in response to chronic kidney disease. The implication is straightforward. Don't expect to see a pathology specimen labeled as renal osteodystrophy. Renal osteodystrophy does reflect the disordered pathophysiologic state associated with advanced renal disease. The implication is that you need to understand the renal perturbations that permit bone to get so messed up. Presented here is a patient with chronic kidney disease. Note the BUN to creatinine ratio of 10 to 1 reflecting intrinsic renal disease, not pre-renal azotemia. The patient is noted with a low calcium. If you understand the basis of hypocalcemia and the physiologic response, then you understand renal osteodystrophy. This will be summarized in the upcoming series of slides. And here's a little pyramid I invented for you. On the top, you will note the failure of vitamin D synthesis. On the left, you have hyperphosphatemia. These two physiologic derangements result in a decreased serum calcium level, as we'll discuss. At the right base, you'll observe the physiologic response to the low serum calcium. This represents secondary hyperparathyroidism. Secondary hyperparathyroidism occurs in response to the chronically depressed serum calcium level. So let's take this a step further. Decreased vitamin D3 translates into a decrease in intestinal calcium absorption. No calcium means no bone mineralization. Bones without minerals are soft. The hyperphosphatemia of chronic kidney disease results in phosphate binding to ionized free calcium. Result is no free calcium. That's not good because if you have no free ionized calcium, you'll have soft unmineralized bone. Further, the parathyroid won't dig that. So what's happening at the parathyroid? The calcium sensing receptor notes low calcium and starts robbing or leaching calcium from the bone. That's not good. The bones are already soft. Now we are activating osteoclasts, which will basically start gobbling up bone to release calcium. The combination of low vitamin D and high phosphate leads to low calcium with resultant hyperparathyroidism representing the perfect storm if your goal is to destroy bone. So let's backtrack for a moment. We described loss of vitamin D, but what does that have to do with the kidney? As you can see, 25-hydroxy vitamin D is synthesized in the liver. It is converted to its active form 125-dihydroxy vitamin D in the kidney. This reaction is mediated by 1-alpha-hydroxylase, which resides in the proximal convoluted tubule. The failing kidney lacks adequate alpha-hydroxylase activity and thereby activated vitamin D. The ultimate outcome of vitamin D deficiency is the failure of intestinal calcium absorption. No calcium means no bone mineralization, and if you can't mineralize bone, the bone is soft. Soft bone, characterized by fracture and pseudofracture, are the hallmark of osteomalacia. As previously noted, the patient with chronic renal failure loses their ability to excrete phosphate. Hyperphosphatemia binds to serum calcium, resulting in decreased availability of ionized free calcium. This is depicted in this nice little drawing I made for you demonstrating a low free ionized calcium. And here is the summary. Be familiar with the two causes of hypocalcemia in patients with chronic kidney disease. The net result is osteomalacia, which represents one of the two manifestations of renal osteodystrophy. Now, the NBME doesn't come right out and say osteomalacia. You need to be familiar with the language they use. The characteristic pathologic description includes a thickened layer of unmineralized osteoid 
with osteoid representing the organic component of bone, which is essentially type 1 collagen. When you see this description, they are telling you the patient has osteomalacia. And just to remind you on the sequence of bone formation or remodeling, osteoblasts lay down collagen. Mineralization is delayed for approximately two weeks to permit collagen to cross-link. However, if calcium is deficient, there is inadequacy of mineralization. The result is an increased layer of collagen or osteoid that was laid down by osteoblasts but never mineralized. And this will be another description of osteomalacia. The patient will be described with an atraumatic fracture or more likely a pseudofracture line that is depicted in the image. Do be aware that any cause of vitamin D deficiency, such as seen in GI malabsorption, may also present with osteomalacia. And finally, we'll turn our attention to the parathyroid gland's response to hypocalcemia. Recall that the parathyroid gland is the only hormone-secreting gland that responds directly to changes in blood mineral levels. The mechanism by which this occurs is through the calcium sensing receptor. A high calcium will suppress PTH secretion, whereas a low serum calcium will stimulate PTH release. And here's the problem. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is not okay. It leaches calcium from bone. That's not okay. The bones are already soft. And you know by now, the NBME has some special nicknames that describes the pathophysiologic process associated with secondary hyperparathyroidism. When PTH leaches bone from the diaphysis, it's called subperiosteal bone resorption. You should be familiar with this term. So just as a thickened layer of unmineralized osteoid refers to osteomalacia, when the NBME says subperiosteal bone resorption, they actually mean to say hyperparathyroidism. And sometimes they just describe this process, in the appropriate context, as bowing of the digits. The NBME writes mysteries, and your job is to piece them together. The second description of hyperparathyroidism includes the pathologic entity of osteitis fibrosa cystica. Osteitis refers to bone, and cystica meaning cavity, cavities or holes in the bones. In osteitis fibrosa cystica, the holes come from those activated osteoclasts. They cause microfractures with bleeding and resulting granulation tissue. The bony lesions in this setting actually look brown, so they're called brown tumors. This ain't rocket science. I would remind you again that PTH stimulates osteoblasts. Osteoclasts are secondarily stimulated through expression of rank ligand, but that's a topic for another day. The NBME can't get enough of this stuff. So what do we have left? Applied pharmacology and a favorite question. Applied pharmacology, as mentioned in other videos, is using pharmacotherapeutics to underscore or reinforce your understanding of key pathophysiologic processes. In renal osteodystrophy, we understand the mechanism of damage so therapy can be sensibly applied. The first treatment option is use of phosphate binders, including Cevelomir. Easy enough. Let's fix the high phosphate. Next step, logically enough, is to replete the low vitamin D. Recall vitamin D increases calcium absorption, but it also increases phosphate absorption, so calcitriol therapy needs to be accompanied by the use of phosphate binders. So now we fix the high phosphate and low vitamin D. With luck, the serum calcium level will rise. The third arm of therapy involves turning off the parathyroid. This is accomplished with the use of the calcium mimetic Sinicalcet. This agent increases the sensitivity of the calcium sensing receptor. It essentially tricks the parathyroid into thinking all is well. By decreasing parathyroid secretion, bone resorption is mitigated. I don't want to overstate the importance of this drug, but I want to get it on your radar screen. I prefer to call it Sinicalcet, underscoring that the sensor of calcium has been reset. If preferable, use the brand name, Sensispar, as in sensor of the parathyroid. Either way, you should be familiar with this role as a calcium mimetic. This triad of therapies represents the pharmacotherapeutic response to the perfect storm of pathophysiologic derangements. So now we're left with our favorite question. Here is the classic question used to assess your understanding of the processes reviewed in this presentation. The key derangement is the low calcium and the body's physiologic response. And that is noted here with answer A, low calcium, high PTH. This question might also appear as a table 
with the same implication. So in this presentation, we reviewed the renal, endo, and GI roles in renal osteodystrophy. We highlighted the bone pathology and the physiologic basis for the derangements. We applied sensible medical therapies based on our understanding of the pathophysiologic derangements. And finally, even though it's been a long haul and we are nearly at the end, I do want to mention material that we did not cover as there is some overlap with our topic. So primary parathyroidism is characterized by hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. That is, primary hyperparathyroidism is the exact opposite of that seen in secondary hyperparathyroidism. Be sure to understand the difference between primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism. And I want to mention two other periosteal disorders for the boards. They aren't really primary periosteal disorders, rather disorders where the periosteum will figure into the question. The first is referred to by Codman's triangle and will be described by the raising of the periosteum in patients with osteosarcoma. This will be covered in a separate recording. The other topic where the periosteum figures prominently into the question is the periosteitis associated with hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. Hypertrophic osteoarthropathy is a perineoplastic phenomenon associated with adenocarcinoma of the lung. It will be described by pain in tubular bones with periosteal reaction. And these are the three key periosteal disorders for the USMLE Step 1. Hyperparathyroidism, Codman's triangle, and hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. And that concludes this 12 Days in March video production of renal osteodystrophy. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, please email me at howard at 12 days in March. Thank you.